This is one of the most important lessons that you will get on this trajectory. In this brief, we're going to look at stalling and spinning. We'll look at why training matters, the mechanics of the stall, factors affecting the stall, the behavior of the aircraft at the stall, and the mechanics of spinning. So firstly, why do we train for this? The National Transport Safety Board of the United States analyzed loss of control accidents in the transport category from 1986 to 1995 to understand what was the root cause of the upset. As you can see from the graph, stalling came out as the number one cause of loss of control accidents. Indeed, there have been several very high profile accidents in the recent years, which have highlighted the importance of understanding how to recognize when the aircraft is stalled and how to effectively recover. Air France 447 and Colgan Air 3407 are two tragic and very prime examples of this. So what is happening at the stall? Well, here we have a wing in normal flight. In, you can see that the airflow, in fact, whilst we consider it as smooth streamlines all the way along the airfoil in simplified diagrams, actually starts to separate from the airfoil towards the trailing edge of the wing. At low angles of attack, this separation point is very close to the trailing edge and so isn't very noticeable. As we increase the angle of attack, however, the separation point starts to move forwards just a little bit. Once we get above the critical angle of attack, the airflow can simply no longer remain attached to the top surface of the wing and the separation point moves rapidly forwards towards the leading edge. It's this condition where the airflow is no longer attached to the top surface of the wing that we know as the stall. As some general knowledge, the French term for the stall is décrochage, which means detachment. And this is a far more satisfactory and explanatory term for what is occurring at the stall. At this point, the lift produced by the wing now drops markedly. So, as we discussed earlier, as we increase our alpha, our angle of attack, the coefficient of lift increases in direct proportion. However, as you can see from this graph, as we reach the critical angle of attack, that point of airflow separation, the lift produced by the wing drops rapidly. So on this graph, just to be absolutely clear, to the right of the dotted line, we say that the aircraft is stalled. To the left of the dotted line, below the critical angle of attack, we say the aircraft is unstalled. So when does the stall happen? Any time the wing exceeds the critical angle of attack. And note that I've not mentioned speed in relation to the stall at all. We can stall at high speeds through manoeuvring and we can fly the aeroplane unstalled to almost zero knots. Speed is completely irrelevant here. The Pilot's Operating Handbook, or the Flight Manual, probably does refer to a stall speed, and often we talk about it in flight. This is accompanied, however, by a set of conditions which are well known, well documented, and should be listed. Often, in a POH, it'll say something like, this was conducted at maximum all-up weight, full flap, power idle, wings level. But the stall speed is typically at a known weight, at a forward C of G, at a low altitude, in 1G flight, and with the wings level. Let's also have a look now at the other factors which can affect the speed at which we see the stall occur. Now, the indicated speed at which the stall occurs depends on many factors, and as I've said, is completely irrelevant to whether the wing is stalled or not. To give you an appreciation for how things may change, Let's just talk about a few of those factors. Some of the factors that you may consider as affecting the speed that which we see the stall occur will be the weight of the aeroplane, the load factor under which we're currently flying, whether the aircraft is turning, the altitude, remember lift is related to the density of the air, the power that we have set. For instance, if we have a very high nose attitude, then the power of the engines is going to have a component of that vector which is going to be acting vertically up. This will assist the lift vector 
in maintaining the aircraft airborne for longer. The construction of the wing, the wing furniture, whether it has vortex generators, whether there are any other high lift devices which are fitted to the aircraft, will have a factor in affecting the speed at which we see the stall occur. Contamination of the wing, whether we've picked up icing, will be an important factor. A more rough wing surface as a result of icing may cause the airflow to detach at a higher speed. The centre of gravity position is another factor. But I can't stress it enough. The critical element to the stall is the angle of attack and not the speed. So when does the stall happen? In the diagram here, every single one of these aeroplanes has exceeded its critical angle of attack and has stalled. So we can say that the stall happens at any attitude and at any airspeed. So this being the case, how do we recognise the stall? I use the acronym SAVEIRS to help me remember the behaviour of an aircraft at the stall. Any or all of these factors indicate that we may be facing a stall. The stick position may be unusually far aft, or in the case of fly-by-wire, may be aft for a longer than usual amount of time. The attitude of the aircraft may be unusually high, but as we've seen, the stall can happen at any attitude, at any airspeed, so it may not always be high. We may be experiencing some buffet. Initially, this may be light buffet, and potentially progress into heavy buffet at the point where the wing is really stalled and a lot of airflow is separated. This buffet is caused by the separated airflow, the disturbed airflow, now hitting the tailplane and causing a vibration through the stick and potentially through the airframe. We may experience instability in the aircraft. It may be notably reluctant to respond to aileron and elevator. The rate of descent will be higher than demanded and we may be experiencing some stick shaker or stick pusher. However, whilst these are useful, this sab is I find is a useful way of remembering behaviour at the stall, not all of these indicators may be present on your aircraft or in the situation in which you find yourself. So what else do we have? Well, modern jet transport aircraft often have some sort of indicators for some of the following. The first is perhaps you have an angle of attack gauge. If you do, then this will be marked with some sort of warning as to the critical angle of attack. You may have something which demonstrates your flight path angle, the angle between your flight path vector and the horizon. And you will almost certainly have something which shows your pitch attitude, the angle between the longitudinal axis and the horizon. The gap between these two indicators, if you have both of them, could be interpreted to show an indicator of your angle of attack. For instance, if there is a very large vertical gap between your flight path vector and your pitch attitude, then you are probably at a very high angle of attack. If you are not lucky enough to have an angle of attack indicator or an indicator of your flight path angle, then you may require a little bit more interpolation, but all is not lost. Your aircraft will definitely have an indicator for pitch attitude. If that can be assessed as being reliable, then you can compare that against your vertical speed indicator. If the vertical speed indicator is showing a very high rate of descent, and your pitch attitude indicator is demonstrating that the nose is above the horizon, then you are probably stalled. Some aeroplanes now have a head-up display, and this gives us another way of seeing this information. The bore sight symbol shows where the nose is pointing, and the flight path vector symbol shows where we're going. We can put this in a lateral view of the aircraft and show that the bore sight is in line with the nose, and the flight path vector is in line with the flight path of the aircraft. The angle between these two can be interpreted to be the angle of attack. So if you see a large split between your bore sight symbol and your flight path vector, then you are probably at a very high angle of attack. However, 
it need not only be visual. Transport aircraft are also required to have stall warning aside from visual cues, which include an auditory warning of the stall and some sort of tactile feedback of the stall. So there may be a voice or an alarm which warns of an impending stall, and this is usually set to occur just before the critical angle of attack is reached. And there may be some sort of stick shaker or stick pusher, which gives you some tactile feedback. The onset of any of these is an indication not to continue increasing the angle of attack. Moving on now, let's have a look at the mechanics of the spin. Here we have our familiar graph of the coefficient of lift versus alpha, our angle of attack. Looking at the top-down view of the aircraft to the left, if we are at a very high angle of attack, approaching the critical angle of attack, and then induce some sort of yawing moment, we will have the effect that the airspeed on the right wingtip will be higher and the airspeed on the left wingtip will be lower. The effect of this variance in airspeed changes the local angle of attack at each of those wingtips. The effect of this difference in angle of attack between the two wings will place them at different points on our lift versus angle of attack curve. If we happen to be stalled or approaching the stall at the point at which this differential as a result of the yaw has occurred, then we will see a lift differential between the two wings. In this case, the slightly faster wing will have a lower angle of attack as marked in green, and the slightly slower wing will have a higher angle of attack as marked in red. As you can see on this graph, there is now a differential in lift, and the differential in lift will induce a roll. This uncommanded roll we call auto rotation. Now, I'm not going to talk about spin recovery actions or really labour the dynamics of the spin itself, because in most transport aeroplanes, the structural loads on the tail can be very high and may exceed the aircraft limitations. What I really want to emphasize at this point, therefore, is that we really must work on recognition and recovery as an incipient stage. So if you experience an uncommanded roll or yaw at a high angle of attack, centralize the controls as the first action and work to reduce your angle of attack. In this brief, we have seen that beyond a critical angle of attack, a stall will occur. In order to counter the effect of that stall or to counter an uncommanded roll or yaw at a high angle of attack, we must reduce the angle of attack. This is one of the most important lessons that you will get from this trajectory.